All right, uh, we'll get started with the uh, Executive Director for Operations session, and it's entitled uh, Nuclear Regulation and a Changing Landscape Strategies, Challenges, and Opportunities. Um, good morning, my name is uh, Ray Furstin. I'm the Acting Executive Director for Operation and at the NRC, and uh, welcome all of you to the second day of the RIC. And I wanted to step back a second and just uh, acknowledge all the all the support we've had for from NRC staff in, in every office to help make this a success. There's a lot of behind the scenes work that goes on and, and I think they've done a flawless job to, to date. So I really like to give them a hand for that. Um, I, I wanted to uh, maybe first uh, uh, address something that Commissioner Kroll mentioned uh, during his talk that, uh, and maybe I'll give a, a, a short testimonial here about the, uh, about the NRC, and you, you, you mentioned that it's a, a special place to work, and, and I guess a, a, a little bit on my background, I have almost uh, well, over 45 years of federal service, but uh, uh, the civilian service, uh, more than 30 years in the Department of Energy and uh, almost six years now at the NRC. And, and when, when I was asked uh, to come to the NRC six years ago, I, uh, I really felt lucky and, and fortunate, and I, I haven't dis been disappointed at all. It's, you know, especially for young people coming into, uh, coming into the, the federal government, it's really what you make out of it. And, and at the stage of my career when I came over here, you I think many of you can tell I'm not exactly a youngster anymore, but I was very fortunate to be able to come over to the NRC. And, and really, there's a lot of satisfaction in the work we do. And it's really what you make out of it. I mean, you can make a difference if you want to. And, and I've uh, been fortunate to have that opportunity. So I just wanted to comment on that. Uh, it is a great place to work. And, and so that's a recruitment plug for the NRC. <laughs> All right. Um, one thing we're, we're going to talk about, I have the office directors from the Office of Nuclear Regulatory Research, uh, Andrea Vale and, and John Lubinsky, he's the director of our Office of Nuclear Regulatory Research. You put Material. me back in research? Yeah. You put me back in research. You just oh, said Oh, I did. That was yeah, a swift sure question. So, okay. uh, uh, Andrea <laughs> Vale and I looked at, uh, worked in uh, uh, research together. So. Yes. Can I, I'm, I'm gonna to try to recover from that now. So, uh, uh, Andrea Vale, the, the Director of Nuclear Reactor Regulation, and then uh, John Lubinsky, now you got me all flustered here, Andrea. <laughs> uh, the Office of Nuclear Material Safety and Safeguards, and, uh, and Morella Gravillis, the uh, Director of, uh, of our uh, uh, Office of Nuclear Security and Incident Response. Um, you know, and as we look into the future, we, we have a, a, a strategic plan some of you may or may not be familiar with. And, and there's, uh, there's uh, three, three goals in our strategic plan. And, a, and in a way, they're, they're challenges. You know, they're, we, we need to ensure the safe and, and secure use of radioactive materials, uh, continue to foster a healthy organization, and inspire stakeholder confidence in the in the NRC, and I think Commissioner Crow, you spent some time talking about uh, that that last goal. Um, I wanted to mention in in uh, in kind of a flow down from the strategic plan. Each quarter, our, our leadership team at the NRC, and uh, which includes all of us on the stage plus uh, other senior leaders throughout headquarters and the regional offices, we meet to review risks to the agency that, that can really impact our ability to achieve the, the goals and objectives of our strategic plan and what we need to do to control those risks. Uh, there, there's currently about 25, and it varies uh, uh, every quarter, about 25 risk items that we discuss each quarter. New ones can get added, uh, some re uh, uh, risks are reduced and others are removed. Uh, and and uh, once the risk is su sufficiently mitigated. And those risks include like staffing, uh, uh, organization culture, NEMA milestones, 
kind of the ones you, that you'd expect. But uh, for this session, I wanted, uh, uh, wanted us to focus on um, two of those uh, uh, high-risk areas for, for the NRC staff. And those are the, the timeliness of, of new SMR and advanced reactor application reviews and the initial and subsequent uh, uh, license renewal reviews. So I'm going to ask each of the office directors, and I'll start with Andrea, the Director of Nuclear Regulatory Research. <laughs> <laughs> Reactor regulations. So. <laughs> anyway, I, I'm going to ask each of the office directors to talk about what, what your office has done to help mitigate risks related to these, these uh, high risk areas to the, to the reputation of the NRC and what, what you are currently doing and what you, what you plan to do to help the agency uh, succeed in, in these, these high risk areas. So, Andrea, why don't you start? All right, thank you, Ray. And the list is very, very long. This is just gonna be a subset, and this is really a testament to the incredible staff that I have that works tirelessly in and out every day to get these accomplishments done. So I'm gonna go through the list that I have here and try to leave time for everyone else. <laughs> so, as you've heard a few times in this, um, Rick, that the commission has given us direction on part 53. And it, it really is a testament to the, the collegial nature of the commission and how your staff work together, and also to our staff who put the policy issues up to be resolved. And so my staff stands ready to implement the direction that we've been given and to have workshops, to have stakeholder engagement, to make sure we can implement on Part 53 direction. We also, um, as you've heard a number of times, issued the um, Kairos Hermes One construction permit, which was the first time in 44 years that this type of activity had occurred. And we used what we learned from that and leveraged that to have an aggressive schedule for Hermes Two that basically came in right behind Hermes One as a 14 month schedule. And that review is going very, very well. We also finalized a readiness assessment for the upcoming X Energy construction permit application, and we provided very critical and specific feedback to the applicant. Um, we looked at stakeholder input, both internal and external, about our website. It sounds simple. Uh, a website can either kind of make or break a project, but we really listened and we work with our partners in the Office of Public Affairs to make sure we have a website now that is content rich, that is more execution focused. A lot of the complaints is that you have to click down several levels to get to the information that you needed and now it's much more user friendly. Um, we accepted the new scale standard design application, uh, approval application, and we're working um, consistently and vigorously on that right now. Uh, this is going back a bit, but we issued two SECI papers on microreactors. This is really a proactive effort back in 2020 and then earlier this year. And we looked at policy issues for microreactors as well and breaking news, well maybe not breaking because we've talked about this in a public meeting, we're really looking at the vision for how we would license nth of a kind reactors and what that would look like and what um, ways we can make that risk informed. And um, obviously we're continuing on that, that discussion. Uh, we have several bilateral agreements, which we've mentioned here as well in various speeches. Um, there is the, uh, yesterday, no, what's today, Wednesday, Monday, there was a MLC signed between CNSC, who we've had an agreement with for many years and kind of reinvigorated it in 2019, but now the UK has joined that effort and we've signed that MOC to exchange um, information. But going back to CNSC, we've issued eight joint reports under the MOC and there are challenging technical issues that we're looking at for specific design. There's both technical and regulatory issues. Um, I'm almost finished and mm -hmm. I'm gonna leave you some time. Um, we've looked at small modular reactors. We're active in every single uh, group that the IAEA has put forth with the NESI, the Harmonization and Standardization Activity. We're very active in NEA activities. Um, I myself am a vice chair on the CNRA and we discuss as regulators issues that are very important to all of us. And last but not least, um, we, continue to try to 
help embarking countries that are looking at nuclear now, and, and many of the commissioners have been to those countries to help give our expertise and help those embarking countries. So I guess we'll, uh, next we'll have John Lubinsky. How does, how does your organization and what, what your office does tie into uh, in, in with what uh, NRR does to, to help mitigate risks in those, those areas? Great, I uh, appreciate that, Ray. And I always appreciate Andre going first because there's such a good relationship between the three offices in here and supporting each other. Uh, when I start to think about what we do as an office, uh, I'll pick up a little bit where Commissioner Crow was, right? We're looking at the front end and the back end of the fuel process, right? The react advanced reactors, operating reactors aren't going to be successful if we don't have a fuel supply on the front end. Um, with respect to advanced reactors, uh, just over the, the last year, year plus, uh, we had four significant licensing actions come in related to high assay low enriched uh, uranium. Uh, this is a new area. Uh, we have not uh, licensed those kind of activities before. Uh, we were fortunate in our fuel session here at Derrick yesterday to have John Donaldson of Centris talk about uh, the successes they had in the licensing process there, uh, and kudos to all the folks who did that. And that's basically an, um, enriching uh, UF6 to HALU levels up to uh, 20%. Uh, we've also approved multiple license amendments uh, for, fuel vent, for fuel manufacturers out there uh, to go above the current uh, 5% up to an 8 weight percent. Uh, kudos to the folks who worked with the vent, um, I'm sorry, the uh, manufacturers on that uh, because we were able to give them certainty on the front end by looking at one of the most risk significant areas for the fuel fabrication and that is in the criticality area. So we were able to work with them on understanding their criticality methodology, going through and having approval of that process first, which provided them additional certainty when they went through the licensing process and followed the integrated safety assessment to identify their items relied on for safety. Uh, and we also approved uh, transportation packages. Again, you're not going to get the fuel uh, from one part of the fuel fabrication process to the other without approved transportation uh, cask. Uh, and we've approved those above the 5% weight as well. So they're all integral to not only the advanced reactor fuels, but the accident tolerant fuels as we move forward. We also uh, provide support in the environmental area. Uh, I think the two biggest ones you've heard about already at the RIC, so I won't go into details, but uh, the license renewal guys, as well as the advanced reactor guys. Uh, just recently, our folks working very closely uh, with folks in NRR provided the uh, license renewal guys to the commission, uh, which is going to provide uh, efficiencies as we continue to move forward in those processes. Outside of uh, advanced reactors, uh, we've continued to do environmental reviews. We've completed three final EISs, two draft EISs, as well as six environmental assessments supporting licensing actions across the operating reactor business line as well as the fuels business lines. Uh, Andrea mentioned uh, Hermes, Kairos Hermes. Again, it was not just the safety side of it, but it was also the environmental side, uh, which the environmental review was completed in 18 months as well, which was significantly shorter than a prior ERS we just did for a site next door. I think it was 70 to 80 percent uh, shorter time frame to complete that while still meeting the hard look required by NEPA to complete that. Uh, and then finally, the initial implementation of Fiscal Responsibility Act changes to NEPA. Uh, we've looked at that already and have uh, started to implement the page restrictions on that, as well as the timeliness. And uh, we've beat that already. There is a 24-month require in looking at EISs. On Kairos, we've already done 18 months. We're going forward on uh, Hermes 2 to do an EA, uh, which again is a uh, efficiency as we move forward. Uh, and we hope to use the lessons learned from both Kairos 1 and Kairos 2, or Hermes 1 and Hermes 2, uh, to make continued changes in that area. Great. Thanks, Thanks. John. How, about, how does how does insert play into all of this, Marilla? So good morning, everyone. Is it on? Yes, it's on. Um, so insert supports both Andrea and John. Um, we do security and emergency preparedness for for the entire agency. Uh, I don't have much to say about subsequent license renewal, um, but there's a general sense of excitement about advanced reactors and what everybody in NSER can do to help regulate them and new technologies as they come on board. And I'm going to 
give, start with some examples that you wouldn't think about. Um, our information security folk are thinking about how are we going to open the doors to sensitive and classified information for applicants who need that information. Our ops officers think how do they need to train uh, to receive the, the uh, operations uh, information of the future. Um, our intelligence analysts are thinking about all these new exciting technologies, the more powerful they are for good, the more powerful they can be for bad. So for example, we heard a bit about AI. Um, they're going to start thinking soon about are there anything that we need to prepare for when it comes to artificial intelligence. Um, Inimicality, you know, recognizing the uh, changing landscape in terms of who owns uh, the facilities we, we regulate. We worked on inimicality recently, on how we review inimicality. But the bulk of the work is in EP and security, where we had some significant um, undertakings in the recent past. As many of you know, we passed the EP rule for SMRs and ONTs. Um, the commission approved it uh, last year, and we're in the process of implementing that. And with the uh, implementation of that rule, we actually have a really flexible emergency preparedness framework. Uh, we have the current regulation for LWRs. We have EP regulations for materials facility. Um, we have EP considerations for transportations. And when you put all those together, we actually have what we need to regulate anything ranging from fusion systems to um, reactors larger than we have today to manufacturing facilities. So what we're working on now is going to be the guidance that's needed to make sure that that technical basis is applied, applied appropriately to all these facilities. In the realm of security, we had the limited security rule. And as the title said, the draft limited scope rule was um, intended to be very similar to how we regulate uh, security at the current uh, reactor fleet. Um, it, it, we figured out, we followed commission direction, figured out how to use those as an entrance criteria into uh, the limited security rule. And it addresses a, a few relaxations that have to do with the number of security officers expected, uh, the uh, secondary alarm station, alternatives to, to physical barriers. But it didn't go as far as it could uh, for advanced technologies. So we took the opportunity to literally insert ourselves into part 53. And we were courageous in how we inserted ourselves in part 53. We didn't start with a blank sheet of paper. We actually looked at how we regulate everything in security, starting from constructions to materials to uh, research and test reactors and, of course, the currently operating fleet. And that's what you will see um, in, in the draft part 53 that um, uh, the staff proposed. Um, another area, you know, uh, let me mention a couple of things about Part 53. I'm very proud of what the staff did in areas like um, fitness for duty. They leveraged the technology that's out there to do fitness for duty differently than we're doing it for, for the fleet today. Uh, in cyber, they're looking about at how they can use the established standards um, by NIST to, to regulate future reactors. So there's a lot of creative thinking there. Um, and finally, the one thing that we're working on now is special nuclear materials. Advanced reactors will have different types of materials from the light water reactors of today throughout the fuel cycle, and we're looking on how we need to uh, address those materials throughout the cycle. 
that's it for me. Right. Thank you, Marella. So I'll start with, uh, we're going to spend the rest of the time with uh, some questions and answers. So I'll, I'm, I think I'll, I'll, I'll start this one with you, John, and, and mm -hmm. I'd like you to all answer. We're getting a lot of good, good questions coming in, but you know, uh, I, I think we, we see it at, in, in, in our workshops and at, at, like at the RIC, the, we use the term, we meaning NRC and others, use the term uh, risk-informed and performance-based quite a lot, but the question for the NRC, are you, are you really performance-based and risk-informed, uh, risk or, or do you just say you are? So how do you answer that? Thanks, Ray. I appreciate that, and, uh, and I'll start, and of course, love to hear from Andre and, uh, and Morello on this. Uh, so the short answer to that is yes, we are risk-informed, and we need to continue to be more risk-informed. Um, and, and let me say that when we make that statement, it, it is clear to me that all of the folks at the NRC are only going to approve NRC licensed activities if they're safe. And I wanna make sure that that's out there. That is our primary mission. Uh, and, and I believe that the intent of everyone at the NRC is to make that happen. In doing so, we have used risk information to get to where we are today. Uh, examples of that when I think about our office is we have looked at every uh, oversight program that we have in the office to make sure that we're focused on the highest risk activities at each of those sites. We have pulled attention away from those areas that are lower risk because we want to make sure we're not spending our effort or licensees effort on lower risk activities. So instead we're focusing on the higher risk. We've completed our review of the entire uh, oversight program uh, to ensure that. And as I said, going forward, I think we need to do that more. Risk informing is a continuum. It, it, you can't say you're there because you need to continue to do that every day and going forward. The question is, how do you get there? And I think it's the training that we need to continue to develop. Uh, I, I wanna give kudos to uh, Marella Gavarellas for her role in the Be Risk Smart and the folks that worked with her on that effort. I was fortunate enough to be part of that. And I would say that every time we make a decision in the agency, we're following the Be Risk, model, Be Risk Smart model and asking the question, what is the real risk associated with this? What, what can go wrong? How likely it is, is it? What are the consequences? How do we mitigate that? And we ask that about every decision that is going forward. Is that causing us to make changes in the way we make the decisions? Yeah, the answer is yes. Do we need to continue to do that more? The answer is yes. I'm gonna use Fusion as one of our other examples here. We're working right now on a rulemaking for Fusion. Uh, and I think it's very important because the, the rule itself is gonna provide high level performance standards. And this gets to the other part of your question about being performance based. We'll set the standards in the regulation, but as we continue to move forward, the designs are gonna be very unique. The designs are gonna be very different. And we need to look at the risk associated with each of those designs and determine is the manner in which they're meeting those performance standards the most, not only effective, but also the most efficient in moving forward. And are we making sure that as we do that, we're applying our resources in the area that provides the most risk. So we follow the Be Risk Smart model and asking the questions are, what are the requirements? Why are we asking the questions? Why are we putting requirements on licensees to do these activities? With the end result being is, what is the safety enhancement that's gonna be made to the plant? How about you, Morella, what did, for that question? Um, so, be really smart is very dear for me, and you know, I, I don't ever miss an opportunity to talk about don't be deceived by the cutesy role. It's actually quite defensible in terms of uh, risk-informed decision-making process. So we're talking being risk-informed and performance-based, and I think performance-based doesn't often come into the conversation, but if you're risk-informed, you've used data to basically uh, use past performance data to assess the risk. If you follow the Be Risk Smart framework and the R in the realizing the framework, you performance monitor your, your uh, decision. So I'm gonna make it personal for, for answer. Um, my realization when I, when I came to this office about three years ago was that like many on the staff in the agency, there was a perception that if you don't see yourself in a PRA, you're not risk informed. So we 
brought it back to the basics. And the basics are what can go wrong, how likely is it, what are the consequences, and how do you mitigate it? Well, um, what I learned pretty soon after coming to answer is that security had those basics built in into their risk. Threat assessment, vulnerabilities, consequences, protection, right? It's, it's maps one to one to risk. And we started having conversations around those elements. We started putting people in the room that can deal with all those elements at the same time. Our intelligence analysts, our vulnerabilities experts, our security experts, uh, and the people who understand consequences. And I honestly don't think that there is any conversation that happens in security at office level that does not discuss those four entities um, these days. So that's how we're applying risk information in day-to-day decision-making. Great. Thanks, Marilla. How about an NRR? Yes. Um, this is actually a really good opportunity. I agree. It's a journey. It's 100% a journey, and we have some notable accomplishments, but I really want to focus on operating reactors. We talk a lot about new and advanced reactors, and rightly so, but the health of operating reactors are integral and foundational to success for new and advanced reactors. So I want to go back to, I think, something that's overlooked a lot. Whenever we get notice of enforcement discretion requests, the NRR staff and, and other staff that they partner with across the agency basically drop what they're doing. It could be a weekend, it could be you know, the, the end of a long day. And they use the information that they have, risk insights, operating experience, whatever plays into that to make that decision often in hours and not days or weeks or months, right? And we do that routinely, and I think that gets forgetting, you know, forgotten sometimes in terms of how we use the information going forward. The second is um, back to license renewal and subsequent license renewal. There are a lot of activities that are going on right now, but there's a few that are very much risk-informed looking forward on, on how we um, look at subsequent license renewal that's gonna come in. We talked in public meetings about a tiered approach. And that approach would be something like if there's information that is ex already, especially uh, initial license renewal, we take that information and see what the deltas are and, and do that review. There's another tier where if these are the two extremes, if there's something that is absolutely new, the chair talked about new you know, aging management programs, if it's new, which there's about six or seven new programs, of course we have to do a more subsequent review on that to make sure we're making a safety decision. We're also going to leverage inspection and oversight. There's a um, different kind of gates as to how you look at license renewal and what inspections would happen and which wouldn't. And so we are actually making decisions on what inspections will we actually need to do. And since it's a continuum with the reactor oversight process of inspections going on during the initial either operation or initial license renewal, we can leverage what we know about that going into subsequent license renewal. So it's definitely a journey. Um, I'm very, very proud of the staff and I wanna really commend them for what they've done thus far on everything, but in subsequent license renewal in particular, it has a lot of scrutiny with Congress, with internal and external stakeholders, and I'm just very proud of how the staff has, has kind of kept the head down and, and done the work and is kind of moving forward with how we're going to do, be more efficient with subsequent license renewal. Yeah, John. Ray, can I, can I add one point on more of the performance-based part? Because I think we've talked a lot about the risk-informed. And I would also, when we're looking at a performance-based implementation of our regulations and our regulations themselves, we also need to look at the balance there. Because when you're, you're looking at the balance between that and our principles of good regulation, right? If you're doing, you, know, you need to have clarity. You need to increase public confidence in what you do. So as you're starting to look at that, you know, performance base provides more flexibility. So therefore things are being done more on a one-off basis, more on a unique basis, maybe associated with one licensee, one facility. Uh, whereas when you're more deterministic and where you go there, it seems to be more clear, it's not as performance-based, you get the clarity, but then you lose the flexibility. So we do need to make sure that we keep a balance there, and a lot of that comes on what the issue is and what the decision is that we're making. 
Thanks. Uh, I'm going to shift gears a little bit. Uh, uh, there's a lot of, lot of good questions coming in. And uh, I think, John, I'll start with you on this one. And it's probably more in your area anyway. Uh, how, how has uh, uh, the staff been incorporating lessons learned and risk-informed decision-making into decommissioning activities? For decommissioning activities. For decommissioning. Uh, thanks. Great question. Number one was already mentioned that uh, we've provided the uh, final decommissioning rule uh, to the commission. Uh, there were a couple items in there that definitely uh, start to, from a risk informed standpoint, provide further efficiencies as we go forward. Uh, working very closely with ENSER on a lot of the requirements for. EP and what an EP program would look like in the future, what a security program would look like in the future. We've put in the regulations a clear risk-informed way of looking at the risk of the plan and what would be needed in moving forward. Uh, many of that was based, much of that was based on interactions we've had with current licensees. So that's how we've taken the lessons learned of what we've learned from licensees that have already had their licenses amended going forward and codified that in the rulemaking. We've gone further also in uh, areas like the decommissioning trust funds where we continue to look at that to make sure that licensees are maintaining the adequate amount of funds for decommissioning going forward. But the question was how often do we need to review those? So the final rule going to the commission allowed for uh, those uh, reports to come in less, frequency, for less frequently. And that's because we have oversight processes uh, that are effective in ensuring that licensees are managing their funds. On a case-by-case -case basis, uh, what, what we're dealing with today in the license termination plans, uh, we had a, a great learning recently on dealing with discrete radioactive particles. Uh, and we were able to work with the industry overall, and I appreciate the Office of Research's work, where we were able to look at it from a risk-informed standpoint to say, what, does the, what is the end result of this under Part 20 from the standpoint of the dose that uh, we re, uh, required folks to meet for the final license termination? And how are we looking at these discrete particles in that sense to say, what is the real likelihood of a dose of someone exceeding those Part 20 limits? Uh, we have not done that before. Uh, the, the cleanup was to remove all the discrete particles, but we found in this case that there was a demonstration where you can meet that standard based on the safety assessment. So we were able to apply that to one of our current facilities going through decommissioning. We were able to use that to develop what we call interim staff guidance uh, moving forward so that we can use that in applications for others. It assures we're meeting regulations, meeting safety standards, as well as providing an option to licensees for a more risk-informed way of doing their decommissioning. Thanks. Uh, I would, I'm going to go back to a, a question. A good question came in on, on risk again. And uh, the question is, in, in the present NRC work environment, uh, where accepting more risk is constantly mentioned, what, what specific uh, value does the NRC staff use for the amount of risk that it is acceptable. I think that's a really interesting question. I'll kind of give my views on it, mm -hmm. and I'll, I'll ask, ask others. I, I think I think the you know what we should really be looking at uh, in 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 addressing risk is uh, a staff at our offices that we we really have to look at. Uh, you know, can we? Not, not so much, it's the decision makers that make the decisions on ex what risk to accept. But I think from a standpoint of our staffs, our obligations, uh, all of us, is to try to quantify that risk, if we can, and at, or qualify it, uh, put some qualitative view on it, if, if we can't quantify it, and then, you know, and then leave that to the decision makers so they can have good information to make good risk decisions. So I think it's more that than it is some particular value. I, what, what, what do you think, Marilla? Yeah, so uh, the sta some on the staff know, but few outside of the agency know that the Be Risk Smart idea started as the accepting risk um, initiative. And we went to Margie Down, the EDO at that time, and we said, bad idea. It's not about accepting risk. It's about accepting the right amount of risk. It's sending the wrong message if we uh, title an initiative accepting risk. 
So it's always about what's the right amount of risk, and that varies with the decision that somebody has to make. We in our own personal life accept risk in some decisions, and yet very little risk uh, in some other decisions. The same holds true organizationally. So we, the staff, have the responsibility of putting together all the information, not just the prob probability and consequences with error bands, but we also have to tell the decision maker, whoever they may be, what the right level of risk is for that decision. That's the conversation that we need to have, and that's the conversation that we're trying to, to have. Would, would you like to comment on that? I'll add to that. When I think about many of the business lines in NMSS, we don't have as much quantitative information associated with risk as uh, we may have in the PRAs. And it's a qualitative discussion. Agree with Merrill 100% of what is the risk level that uh, is appropriate as you're moving forward. But the other part of that question is, what information did you use to get there? And I think that's where the conversation goes of when you're talking qualitatively, people may come in and, and have a different perspective on what is the likelihood of that and may talk past each other. So instead, if you can get to the conversation of what are you really talking about of the probability of this, also what are the consequences? And can I live with some of those consequences? Uh, if the consequences are uh, that it may require more work later, maybe it's acceptable because of the amount of, of likelihood or the low likelihood of it occurring. But I think those conversations where you start to use those terms, what is the likelihood, what is the consequence, and at the end of the day saying, as the decision maker, I am willing to accept this risk in moving forward, and having the folks understand why you made that determination to accept that risk is most important. That goes from the standpoint of communicating with our licensees, with folks within the NRC, and also with our members of the public in having that communication of why we've accepted that. Nothing in life is risk-free. No matter what decision you make, you're incurring some level of risk. And the question is, did the option you choose going forward, is that an acceptable level of risk you're willing to live with? Andrew, would you like to come in? I'm going to key off something Morella said and kind of flip the focus a bit because this is literally a conversation I just had yesterday. So it's very important if you can quantify and qualify something to give to a decision maker. And it's not just about, like you said, PRA or error bands. It's in all the decisions that you make pretty much as soon as you wake up to when you go to sleep. So we were talking in NRR from the perspective of workload and how to alleviate some workload of things coming up. Because everyone knows I'm not a micromanager. If everything had to come through me, nothing would happen in NRR. There could be a bottleneck just sheerly because of schedule. So we started looking at projects and figuring out what's the risk of pushing the decisions of these particular products. And some of them are extremely important, highly visible products. What's the risk to us as an agency or to NRR about pushing those products down? And we literally went through and said, how many times have we had to redirect on this particular activity? If we did, was it a fatal flaw? Was it something that could have caused either, um, you know, some, there's no safety issue because we wouldn't push it down if we really needed to be involved in that. But what is, is there a reputational risk if something wasn't quite as polished as it would be if we didn't kind of look at it, look at it from our perspective? And we decided we're willing to take that risk on a number of products that would save people time and that would allow them to make the decisions. And then, like you said, if you have to come back and kind of reassess after and do more work later, that's a risk you take. And that goes back to the be risk model, be risk smart model. Whenever I talk about it, I say legal, administrative, you know, training, HR. It's not just the technical offices, Office of Public Affairs, everyone. What's the risk you're willing to take based on the information that you have, either coming up to a decision maker or pushing things down for the efficiency of your organization, then you can spend more time on other things. Yeah, 
all good, all good points. Thanks for that. So I'm going to uh, go back. There's a question uh, related. Uh, we we talked. We, we I introduced this with maybe the two top risk areas we were going to talk about, and then we uh, one one of those was the licensing uh, uh, reviews for SMRs and advanced reactors. So I'll I'll start this with you, Andrea. Um, can can you talk about the the challenges that that remain that that keep this risk high? We talked about. A revisit in the risk, and it's in a it's a, a high risk area. And it should be. What, yeah. what do you see the challenges we have? Yeah, some of the challenges are just the first of a kind nature of of what's coming in. How much time do you spend on looking at particular aspects? And a lot of the aspects are highly, 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 highly technical. And so we may have to spend more time making sure we're making a reasonable assurance determination. We're not trying to get to um, something you know, in addition to reasonable assurance, but you have to understand the issue not only to be able to make the determination, but something that Commissioner Kroll said, being able to explain it to the public, to be able to defend your decision and have confidence that the decision you made is correct. The other challenge is staffing. You know, it can be very difficult, especially in a post-pandemic, um, you know, time frame that we're in, and Commissioner Crowell talked about compensation, and and we we borrow from each other. It's a very small industry, so staffing, um, even if we are able to get people in, sometimes the turnover is such that our licensees have you know worked with a particular PM or a particular. Um, technical expert and that expert changes. So we really have to focus on knowledge management. We have to focus on, we do videos a lot to make sure that something is sustainable for new people coming in. Um, we have an NRI, what's called a, a, a ET executive team um, chat where we impart knowledge and also a significant topic. And we deep dive on some of these reviews and make sure the material is available. So it can be challenging to make sure you have the, the people there, that the people stay, and that we are focusing on the most important items with this first of a kind technology. So we spend a lot of time kind of talking about what should we be spending most of our time on and how do we explain that and defend that to the public? Yeah, I'd like to go to you on, on something that Andrea said about, you know, you know the, 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 the first of a kind, then you go to the nth of a kind, but let me back up on staffing something, and, and in your area, John, how do you, how do you manage the, uh, the, the staffing needs for, for this? I mean, you, you, you staff up and in anticipation sometimes, but uh, uh, how, do you, how do you make sure that, that we have the staff that's ready to, ready to address the, 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 the new licensing activities that come in. Thanks, so appreciate that. So the, let me go to the challenge first and it hits the staffing, right? The, the challenge we have right now with many of the new technologies, it's first of a kind, and I'll use the example in the front end of the process as well as the back end of the fuel process, is the, the major issue is in the criticality area and in understanding where are you when you go from the 5% to 20% enriched uranium? What kind of benchmarks do you have in place there? And what we've determined in looking at that is that we had to add certain levels of uncertainty, uh, to take into account certain levels of uncertainty in making our licensing decisions uh, because uh, we didn't have the data. We have data below 5% and we can be more efficient going forward. As we get more data into benchmarking, that's gonna allow us to be more efficient in the requirements we put in place moving forward. I use that as an example because they say, how do we prepare? Well, we identified this as a key issue. So we wanna make sure that we're bringing on uh, folks in the organization that have criticality expertise, that have HP expertise, those that are gonna be needed for the most critical areas moving forward. And then going forward from a strategic standpoint is, whether they're working on an application for the front end of the process, the back end of the process, working, moving over to Andrea's shop to be able to work in that area. Uh, we can do that because we've got the uh, critical skill sets that are needed for the key issues that are there in the future. The challenge we see as we move forward is having enough predictability of uh, what applications are gonna come in and when. Uh, during our fuel session, we talked about that yesterday. Making sure that we have a clear understanding of what the landscape looks like when the applications are coming so that number one, we can have enough folks in place to review the applications, folks have the critical skill sets. 
To counter that is we need to make sure that we're not overstaffing. Uh, the agency has gone through that once before uh, where we, we did staff up 2005, 2006, and then had to go the opposite direction going forward. That has an impact on staff morale, that has an impact on recruiting, that has an impact on how we continue to staff the agency. And for our licensees out there, it has a direct impact on them because they're paying annual fees to us to support these activities. And if we're budgeting up, if we're putting more folks in place, and then we don't get the applications coming in, the end result is they're gonna to have to pay the additional fees for the staff to, that uh, we staffed up. Right. Morella, you get the final comment on challenges ahead here. So, so hiring, of course, that's, that's on everybody's mind. And I, I'm going to, to just say, when we need an expert, we need to hire the expert that we need for the issue at hand. And I'll leave it at that. All right, well, uh, in, in closing this session, I'd just like to uh, thank all of you for, for uh, uh, helping me with this plenary session here and, and really picking up most of the load there. But, but I, I did like to close by saying I, I'm, I'm really optimistic about the, the, the future of, of advanced nuclear technologies and the future of nuclear in general. And, and, and I think here at the NRC, we're, we're really uh, up to the challenges and we're, we're, we're all in this together and we, we have to step up and show that, uh, that we're, we're, uh, we're up to uh, solving the issues and challenges we have. So with that, I'll close the session and thank you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you.